Chapter 4. When Jode heard the truck get underway, the cure climbing up to gear, and the ground throbbing under the rubber beating of the tires, he stopped and turned about and watched it until it disappeared. When it was out of sight, he still watched the distance and the blue air shimmer. Thoughtfully, he took the pint from his pocket, unscrewed the metal cap, and sipped the whiskey delicately, running his tongue inside the bottleneck and then around his lips to gather any in any flavor that might have escaped him. He stood experimentally. There we spied a... And that was all he could remember. At last, he turned about and faced the dusty side road that cut off at right angles through the fields. The sun was hot, and no wind stirred the sifted dust. The road was cut with furrows where dust had slid and settled back into the wheel tracks. Joe took a few steps, and the flower-like dust spurted up in front of his new yellow shoes, and the yellowness was disappearing under the gray dust. He leaned down and untied the laces, slipped off the first, uh, slipped off first one shoe and then the other, and he worked his damp feet con comfortably into the hot, dry dust until little spurts of it came up between his toes, and until the skin on his feet tightened with dryness. He took off his coat and wrapped his shoes in it, and bundled, and slipped the bundle under his arm. And at last, he moved up the road, shooting the dust ahead of him, making a cloud that hang lo hung low to the ground beneath and behind him. The right of way was fenced. Two strands of barbed wire on willow poles. The poles were crooked and badly trimmed. Whenever a crotch came to the proper, proper height, the wire lay in it, and where there was no crotch. The barbed wire was lashed to the post with a rusty bailing wire. Beyond the fence, the corn lay beaten down by the wind and heat and drought, and the cups where, where leaf joint stock were filled with dust. Joe plodded along, dragging his cloud of dust behind him. A little bit ahead, he saw the high dome shell of a land turtle crawling slowly up, along through the dust, its legs working stiffly and jerkily. Jode stopped to watch it, and a shadow fell on the turtle. Instantly, head and legs were withdrawn, and the short, thick tail clamped si sideways into the shell. Jode picked it up and turned it over. The back was brown-gray, like the dust, but the underside of the shell was creamy yellow, clean and smooth. Jode shifted his, his bundle high under his arm and stroked the smooth undershell with his finger, and he pressed it. It was softer than the back. The hard old head came out and tried to look at the pressing finger, and the legs waved wildly. The turtle wetted on Jode's hand and struggled uselessly in the air. Jode turned it back upright and rolled it up under his coat with his shoes. He could feel it pressing and struggling and fussing under his arm. He moved ahead more quickly now, dragged his heels a little in the fine dust. Ahead of him, beside the road, a scrawny, dusty willow tree cast a speckled shade. Joe could see it ahead of him, its poor branches curving over the way, its load of leaves tattered and scraggly as a molting chicken. Joe was sweating now, his blue shirt darkened down his back and under his arm. He pulled at the visor of his cap and creased it in the middle breaking its cardboard lining so completely that it could never look new again, and his steps took on new speed and intent toward the shade of the distant willow tree. At the willow, he knew there would be shade, at least one hard bar of absolute shade thrown by the trunk since the sun had passed its zenith. The sun whipped the back of his neck now and made a, hum a little humming in his head. He could not see the base of the tree, for it grew out of a little swale that held water longer than he than the level places. Joad speeded his pace against the sun, and he started down to the declivity. He slowed cautiously, for the bar of absolute shade was taken. A man sat on the ground, leaning against the trunk of the tree. His legs were crossed, and one bare foot extended nearly as high as his head. He did not hear Joad approaching for he was whistling solemnly the tune of, Yes, sir, that's my baby. He ex his extended foot swung slowly up and down in tempo. It was not dance tempo. 
he stopped whistling and sang an easy, thin tenor. Yes, sir, that's my savior. Jesus is my savior. Jesus is my savior now. On the level, tis not the devil. Jesus is my savior now. Jode had moved into the imperfect shade of the molting leaves before the man heard him come in, stopped his song, and turned his head. It was a long head, bony, tight of skin, and set on a, ne on a neck as stringy and muscular as a celery stalk. His eyeballs were heavy and protruding. The lids stretched to cover them, and the lids were raw and red. His cheeks were brown and shiny and hairless, and his mouth full, humorous or sensual. The nose, beaked hard, stretched in the skin so tightly that the bridge showed white. There was no perspiration on the face, not even on the tall, pale head, the forehead. It was an abnormally high forehead, lined with delicate blue veins at the temples. Fully half of the face was above the eyes. His stiff gray hair was mussed back from his brow as though he had combed it back with his fingers. For clothes, he wore overalls and a blue shirt. A denim coat with brass buttons and a spotted brown hat creased like a pork pie lay on the ground beside him. Canvas sneakers, gray with dust, lay nearby where they had fallen when they were kicked off. The man looked long at Joe. The light seemed to go far in his, into his brown eyes, and it picked out little gold, golden specks deep in, rot, in irises. The strained bundle of neck muscles stood out. Jode stood still in, t in the speckled shade. He took off his cap and mopped his wet face with it and dropped it and rolled his coat on the ground. The man in the absolute shade uncrossed his legs and dug with his toes at the earth. Jode said, Hi, it's hotter than hell on the road. The seated man stared questioningly at, at him. Now, ain't you young Tom Jode, old Tom's boy? Yeah, said Jode, all the way. Going home now. You wouldn't remember me, I guess, the man said. He smiled, and his full lips revealed great horse teeth. teeth. Oh no, you wouldn't remember. You was always too busy pulling little girls' pigtails when I gave you the, gave you the whole spirit. You was all wrapped up and yanking that pigtail out, of, out by the roots. You maybe don't recollect what I do. The two of you come to Jesus at once because of the pigtail yanking. Baptized both of you in irrigation ditch at once, fighting and yelling like a couple of cats. Joe looked at him with drooped eyes, then he laughed. Why, you're the preacher, you're the preacher. I just passed a recollection of, about you to a guy not an hour ago. I was a preacher, said the man seriously. Reverend Jim Casey was a burning busher, used to howl out the name of Jesus to glory and used to get an irrigation dish so squirming full of repented sinners, half of them like to drown. But not no more, he sighed. Just Jim Casey now. Ain't got the call no more. Got a lot of sinful ideas, and they seem kind of sensible. Jode said, you're bound to get ideas if you go thinking about stuff. Sure, I remember you. Used to give a, used to give a good meeting. I recollect one time you give a whole sermon walking around on your hands, yelling your head off. Ma favored you more than anybody, and Grandma says you was just lousy with the spirit. Joe dug at his rolled coat and found the pocket, and brought up his, brought out his pint. The turtle moved a leg, but he wrapped it up tightly. He unscrewed the cap and held out the bottle. Have a little snort. Casey took the bottle and regarded it, regarded it broodingly. I ain't preaching no more or much. The spirit ain't the, in the people in the, much no more. And worse than that, the spirit ain't in me no more. Of course, now, now and again, the spirit gets moving and I rip out a meeting. Or when folks sets out food, I give them a grace. But my heart ain't in it. I only do it because they expect it. Joe mopped his face with his cap again. You ain't too damn holy to take a drink, are you? Yes. Casey seemed to see the bottle for the first time. He tilted it back and took three big swallows. Nice drinking li liquor, he said. Ought to be, said Jode. That's factory liquor. Cost a buck. Casey took another swallow before he passed the bottle back. Yes, sir, he said. Yes, sir. Jode took the bottle from him and in politeness did not wipe the neck with his sleeve before he drank. He squatted on his hams and set the bottle upright against his coat roll. 
His fingers found a twig to, with which to draw his thoughts in the, on the ground. He swept the leaves from a square and smoothed the dust, and he drew angles and made little circles. I ain't seen you in a long time, he said. Nobody's seen me, said the preacher. I went off alone, and I sat and figured. The spirit's strong in me, only it ain't the same. I ain't so sure of a lot of things. He sat up straighter against the tree. His bony hand dug its way like a squirrel into his overall pocket, brought out a black bitten plug of tobacco. Carefully, he brushed off bits of straw and gray pocket fuzz before he bit off a corner and settled the quid in his cheek. Jode waved his stick in negation when the plug was held out to him. The turtle dug at the rolled coat. Casey looked over the stirring garment. What you got there? A chicken? You'll smother it. Joe rolled the coat up more tightly. An old turtle, he said. Picked, it up, picked him up on the road. An old bulldozer. Thought I'd take him to my little brother. Kids like turtles. The preacher nodded his head slowly. Every kid got a turtle sometime or the other. Nobody can keep a good turtle, though. They work at it, and they work at it. And at last, one day, they get out, and, they, and away they go. Off somewheres. It's like me. I wouldn't take the good old gospel that was laying there in my, to my hand. I got to be picking at it and working at it until I got it all tore down. Here I got the spirit sometimes and nothing to preach about. I got the call to lead people and no place to lead them. Lead them around and around, said Jode. Sling them in the irrigation ditch. Tell them they'll burn in hell if they don't th think like you. What the hell you want to lead them someplace for? Just lead them. The straight trunk shade had stretched out along the ground. Joe moved gratefully into it and squatted on his hams and made a new smooth place on which to draw his thoughts with a stick. A thick furred yellow shepherd dog came trotting down the road, his head low, tongue lolling and dripping. Its tail hung limply curled and it panted loudly. Joe whistled at it, but it only dropped its head an inch and trotted fast towards some definite destination. Going someplace, Joe explained. A little piped. Going for home, maybe. The, the preacher could not be thrown from his subject. Going someplace, he repeated. That's right, he's going someplace. Me, I don't know where I'm going. Tell you what, I used to get the people jumping and talking in tongues and glory shouting till they just fell down and passed out. And some I'd baptize to bring them to. And then, you know what I'd do? I'd take one of them girls out in the grass and I'd lay with her. Done it every time. Then I'd feel bad, and I'd pray and pray. But it didn't do no good. Come next time, them and me was full of the spirit. I'd do it again. I figured there just wasn't no hope for me, and I was a damned old hypocrite. But I didn't mean to be. Joe smiled, and his long teeth parted, and he licked his lips. There ain't nothing like a good hot man for him pushing him over, he said. I'd done that myself. Casey leaned forward excitedly. You see, he cried, I seen it was that way, and I started I started thinking. He waved his bony, big knuckled hand up and down in a patting gesture. I got to think in like this. Here's me preaching grace, and here's them people getting grace so hard. They're jumping and shouting. Now they say laying up with a girl comes from the devil. But the more grace a girl had gotten her, the quicker she wants to go out in the grass. And I got to think, thinking, how in the hell, excuse me, can the devil get in when a girl is so full of the Holy Spirit that it's spouting out of her nose and ears? You'd think that that'd be one time when the devil didn't stand a snowball's chance in hell. But there it was. His eyes were shining with excitement. He worked his cheeks for a moment and then spat into the dust. And the goblet spit rolled over and over, picking up dust until it looked like a round, dry little pellet. The preacher spread out his hand and looked at his palm, as though he were reading a book. And there's me. He went on softly. There's me with all them people's souls in my hand, responsible and feeling my responsibility. And every time, I lay with one of them girls. He looked over at Jode. His face looked helpless. His expression asked for help. Jode carefully drew the torso of a woman in, in the dust. Breasts, hips, pelvis. 
I wasn't never a preacher, he said. I never let nothing go by when I could catch it. I never had no ideas about it, except then I was a goddamn glad when I got one. But you wasn't a preacher, Casey insisted. A girl was just a girl to you. They wasn't nothing to you. But to me, they was holy vessels. I was saving them their souls. And here, with all that responsibility on me, I'd just get them frothing with the Holy Spirit, and then I'd take them out in the grass. Maybe I should have been a preacher, said Jode. He brought out his tobacco and papers and rolled a cigarette. He lighted it and squinted through the smoke at the preacher. Been, I've been a long time without a girl, he said. It's going to take some, th uh, some catching up. Casey continued. It worried me till I can get no sleep. Here, I'd go pre to preach him and say, By God, this time I ain't going to do it. And right while I said it, I know what I was. You should should have got a wife, said Jode. Preacher and his wife stayed at our place one time. Jehovites, they was. Slipped upstairs. Held meetings in our barnyard. Us kids would listen. That preacher's missus was took a god-awful pounding after every night meeting. I'm glad you told me, said Casey. I used to think it was just me. Finally, it gave me some such pain. I quit and went off by myself and give her a damn good thinking about. He doubled up his legs and scratched between his dry, dusty toes. I says to myself, what's not on you? Is it the screwing? And I says, no, it's a sin. And I says, why is it that when a fella ought to be just about meal ass proof against sin and full up of Jesus, why is it that's the time a fella gets finger in his pants buttons? He laid two fingers down in his palm in rhythm, as though he gently placed each word there side by side. I says, maybe it ain't a sin. Maybe it's just the, woke, the way folks is. Maybe we've been whipping the hell out of ourselves for nothing. And I thought how some sisters took to beating their, their selves with a three-foot shag of bob wire. And I thought how maybe they liked to hurt themselves. And maybe I liked to hurt myself. Well, I was laying under a tree when that and when I figured that out. And I went to sleep. And come night, and it was dark, when I come to, there was a coyote squawking nearby. Before I noted it, I was saying out loud, Hell with it. There ain't no sin and there ain't no virtue. There's just stuff people do. It's all part of the same thing. And some of the things folks do is nice, and some ain't nice. But that's as far as any man got a right to say. He paused and looked up from the palm of his hand where he had laid down the words. Jode was grinning at him now, but Jode's eyes were sharp and interested too. You give her a going over, he said. You figured her out. Casey spoke again, and his voice rang with pain and confusion. I says, what's uh, what's this call, this spirit? And I says, it's love. I love people so much, I'm fit to bust sometimes. And I says, don't you love Jesus? Well, I thought and thought, and finally I says, no. I don't know nobody named Jesus. I know a bunch of stories, but I only love people. And sometimes I love them fit to bust. And I want to make them happy. So I've been preaching something I thought would make them happy. And then, I've been talking a hell of a lot. Maybe you wonder about me using bad words. Well, they ain't bad to me no more. They's just words folks use. And they don't mean nothing bad with them. Anyway, I'll tell you one more thing I thought out. And from a preacher, it's the most unreligious thing. But I can't be a preacher no more because I thought it and I believe it. What's that? Casey looked shyly at him. If it hits you wrong, don't take no offense at it, will you? I don't take no offense except a bust in the nose, said Jode. What did you figure? I figured about the Holy Spirit and the Jesus friend. I figured, why do we got to hang on it on God or Jesus? Maybe, I figured, maybe it's all men and all women we love. Maybe that's the Holy Spirit, the human spirit, the whole shebang. Maybe all men got one big soul everybody's a part of. Now, I sat there thinking, thinking it, and all of a sudden, I knew it. I knew it so deep down that it was true, and I still know it. Jode's eyes dropped to the ground as though he could not meet the naked honesty in the preacher's eyes. You can't hold no church without 
ideas like that, he said. People would drive you out of the country with ideas like that. Jumping and yelling. That's what folks like. Makes them feel swell. When grandma got to talking in tongues, you couldn't tie her down. She could knock over a full-grown deacon with her fist. Casey regarded him broodingly. Something I'd like to ask you, he said. Something that's been eating on me. Go ahead. I'll talk sometimes. Well, the preacher said slowly, here's you that I baptized right when I was in glory roof tree. Got little hunks of Jesus jumping out of my mouth that day. You won't remember it because you was busy pulling that pigtail. I remember it, said Joe. That was Susie Little. She bust my finger a year later. Well, did you take any good out of that baptizing? Was your ways better? Joe thought about it. No, I can't say I felt as I felt anything. Well, did you take any bad from it? Think hard. Joe picked up the bottle and took a swig. There wasn't nothing in it, good or bad. I just had fun. He handed the flask to the preacher. He sighed and drank and looked at the low level of whiskey and took another tiny drink. That's good, he said. I got to worrying about whether in messing around maybe I'd done somebody a hurt. Joe looked over toward his coat and saw the turtle, free of the clock, hurrying away in the direction he had been following when Joe found him. Joe watched him for a moment and then got slowly to his feet and retrieved him and wrapped him in the coat again. I ain't got no present for the kids, he said, nothing but this old turtle. It's a funny thing, the preacher said. I was thinking about old Tom Joad when you come along, Think, thinking I'd call in on him. I used to think he was a godless man. How is Tom? I don't know how he is. I ain't been home for four years. Didn't he write to you? Joad was embarrassed. Well, Pa wasn't no hand to write for pretty, or to write for writing. He'd sign up his name as nice as anybody, and lick his pencil, but Pa never did no write, write no letters. He always says what he couldn't tell a fella with his mouth wasn't worth leaning on no pencil about. Been traveling around, Casey asked. Joe regarded him suspiciously. Did you hear me? I was in all the papers. No, I never. What? He jerked one leg over the other and settled lower against the tree. The afternoon was advancing rapidly, and a richer tone was growing in the sun. Joe said pleasantly, might as well tell you and get over with it. But if you were still preaching, I wouldn't tell you. I fear you get praying over me. He drained the last of the pint and flung it from him, and the flat brown bottle skidded lightly over the dust. I've been in McAllister them four years. Casey swung around to him, his brows lowered so that his tall forehead seemed to seemed even taller. Ain't wanted to talk about it, huh? I won't ask you no questions. If you done something bad, I'd do what I'd done again, said Joe. I killed a guy in a fight who was drunk at a dance. He got a knife in me, and I killed him with a shovel that was laying there. Knocked his head plumb to squash. Casey's eyebrows resumed their normal level. You ain't ashamed of nothing then? No, said Joe. I ain't. I got seven years, a count of he had a knife on me. Got out in four. Parole. Then you ain't heard nothing about your folks for four years? Oh, I heard. Ma sent me a card two years ago, and last Christmas, Grandma sent a card. Jesus. The, the guys in the cell block laughed. Had a tree and shiny stuff. Looks like snow. It says in poetry, Merry Christmas, pretty child. Jesus meek and Jesus mild. Underneath the Christmas tree, there's a gift for you from me. I guess Grandma never read it. Probably got it from a drummer and picked out the one with the most shiny stuff on it. The guys in my cell block goddamn near die laughing. Jesus Meek, they called me after that. Grandma never meant it funny. She just figured it was so pretty she wouldn't bother to read it. She lost her glasses the year I went up. Maybe she didn't never did find them. How they treat you in McAllister? Casey asked. Oh, all right. You eat regular and you get clean clothes. And there's places to take a bath. It's pretty nice some ways. Makes it hard having no woman, not having no woman. Suddenly he laughed. There was a guy paroled, he said, about a month. He's back for breaking parole. A guy asked him what, why he busts his parole. Well, hell, he says, they got no conveniences at my old man's place. Got no electric lights, no shower baths. 
There ain't no books, and the food's lousy. Says he come back where they got a few of conveniences, and he eats regular. He says it makes him feel lonesome out there in the open, having to think about what to do next. So he stole a car and come back. Judd got out his tobacco and blew a brown paper free of the pack and rolled a cigarette. The guy's right, too, he said. Last night, thinking where I'm going to sleep, I got scared. And I got to thinking about my bunk. And I wonder what the stir bug I got for a cellmate is doing. Me and some guys had a strang band going. Good one. The guy said we ought to go on the radio. And this morning, I didn't know what time to get up. Just laid there waiting for the bell to go off. Casey chuckled. Fella can get so he misses the noise of the sawmill. The yellowing, dusty afternoon light put a golden color on the land. The corn stalks looked golden. A flight of swallows swooped overhead toward some water hole. The turtle in Joe's coat began a new campaign of escape. Joe creased the visor of his cap. It was getting the long protruding curve of crow's beak now. Guess I'll mosey along, he said. I hate to hit the sun, but it ain't so bad now. Casey pulled himself together. I ain't seen old Tom in a bug's age, he said. I was going to look in on him anyways. I bring Jesus to your folks for a long time, and I never took up a collection nor nothing but a bite to eat. Come along, said Joe. Paul will be glad to see you. He always said you got too long a pecker for a preacher. He picked up his coat roll and tightened it snugly about his shoes and turtle. Casey gathered in his canvas sneakers and shoved his bare feet into them. I ain't got your confidence, he said. I'm always scared there's wire or glass under the dust. I don't know nothing I hate so much as a cut toe. They hesitated on the edge of the shade, and then they plunged into the yellow sunlight like two swimmers hastening to get to shore. After a few fast steps, they slowed to a gentle, thoughtful pace. The corn stalks threw gray shadows sideways now and the raw smell of hot dust was in the air. The cornfield ended, and dark green cotton took its place. Dark green leaves threw a film of dust, and the ball was forming. It was spo uh, spotty cotton, thick in the low places where the water, water had stood, and bare on the high places. The plants strove against the sun, and distance toward the horizon was tanned to invisibility. The dust road stretched out ahead of them, waving up and down. The willows of a stream lined across the west, and to the northwest, a fallow section was going back to the sparse brush. But the smell of burned dust was in the air, and the air was dry, so that the mucus in the nose dried to a crust, and the eyes watered to keep the eyeballs from drying out. Casey said, see how good the corn come along until the dust got up, been a dinger of a crop. Every year, said Jode, every year I can remember we had a good cop come in, and it never come. Grandpa said she was good the first five plowings, while the wild grass was still in her. The roads dropped down a little hill and climbed up another rolling hill. Casey said, Old Tom's house can't be more than a mile from here. Ain't she over that third rise? Sure, said Jode, lest somebody stole it, like Pa stole it. Your postulate? Sure. Got it a mile and a half east of here and drug it. it. Was a family living there and they moved away. Grandpa and Pa and my brother, Noah, liked to took the whole house, but she wouldn't come. They only got a part of her. That's why she looks so funny on one end. They cut her in two and drug her over with twelve head head of horses and two mules. They was going back to the other half and stick her together, but before they got there, Wink Manley come with his boys and stole the other half. Pa and Grandpa were pretty sore, but a little later, them and Wink got drunk together and laughed their heads off about it. Wink, he says the house is a stud, and if we'll bring Aaron over and breed him, we might get little. Uh, we might get a litter of crap houses. Wink was a great old fella when he was drunk. After that. Him and Pa and Grandpa was friends. Got drunk together every chance they got. Tom's a great one, Casey agreed. They plodded dustily on down to the bottom of the draw, and they then slowed their steps for the rise. Casey wiped his forehead with his sleeve and put on his flat-topped hat again. Yes, he repeated, 
Tom was a great one. For a godless man, he was a great one. I seen him in meetings sometimes when the spirit got into him just a little, and I seen him take 12 to 10, 12 foot jumps. I tell you, when the old Tom got a dose of the Holy Spirit, you got to move fast to keep it from getting run down and tromped. Jumpy as a stud horse in a box stall. They topped the next rise and the road dropped into a water, old water cut, ugly and raw, a ragged course, and fresh at scars cutting into it from both sides. A few stones were in the crossing. Joe admits to cross his, his bare feet. You talk about Pa, he says. Maybe you never seen Uncle John the time they ta baptized him over at Polk's place. Why, he got to plunging and jumping. Jumped over a feeny bush as big as a piano. Over he'd jump and back he'd jump, howling like a dog wolf in the moon time. Well, Pa seen him, and Pa, he figures he's the best Jesus jumper in these parts. So Pa picks out a feeny bush, about, about twice it as big as Uncle John's feeny bush. And Pa lets out a squawk, like a, saw, a sow littering broken bottles. And he takes a run at that feeny bush and clears her, and busts his right leg. That took the spirit out of Pa. Preacher wants to pray, it said. But Pa says no, by God. He'd got his heart full of having a doctor. Well, they wasn't a doctor, but they was a traveling dentist. And he said her. Preacher, give her a praying over anyways. They plotted up the little rise on the other side of the water cut. Now that the sun was on the wane, some of its impact was gone, and while the air was hot, the hammering rays were weaker. The strung wire on the crooked poles still edged the road. On the right side, right hand side, a line of wire fence strung out across the cotton field, and the dusty green cotton was the same on both sides, dusty and dry and dark green. Joe pointed to the boundary fence. That there's our line. We didn't really need no fence there, but we had the wire, and Pa kind of liked her there. Said it gave him a feeling uh, that 40 was 40. Wouldn't have had the fence if Uncle John didn't come driving in one night with six spools of wire in his wagon. He gave him to Pa for a show. We never did know where he got that wire. They slowed for the for the rise, moving their feet in the deep, soft dust, feeling the earth with their feet. Joe's eyes were inward on his memory. He seemed to be laughing inside himself. Uncle John was a crazy bastard, he said. Like what he'd done with that shout, he chuckled and walked on. Jim Casey waited impatiently. The story did not continue. Casey gave it a long time to come out. Well, what'd he do with that shout, he demanded at last, with some irritation. Huh? Oh, well, he killed that shout right there, and he got Ma to light up the stove. He cut out pork chops and put them in the pan, and he put ribs and a leg in the oven. He ate chops until the ribs was done, and he ate ribs till the leg was done. And then he tore it into that leg, cut off big hunks of her, and shoved them in his mouth. Us kids hung around slaver in, and he give us some, but he wouldn't give Pa none. By and by, he ate so much, he throwed up and went to sleep. While he's asleep, us kids and Pa finished off the leg. Well, when jo Uncle John woke up in the morning, he slapped another leg in the oven. Pa says, John, you gonna eat that whole damn pig? And he says, I aim to, Tom, but I'm scared some of her will spoil before I get to her, before I get her eaten. Hungry as I am for pork, maybe you better get a plate and give me back a couple of rolls of wire. Well, sir, Pa was no fool. He just let Uncle John go and eat the pig, eat it himself, sick of pig. And when he drove off, he hadn't eaten much more than half. Pa says, why don't you salt her down? But not Uncle John. When he wants a pig, he wants a whole pig. And when he's through, he don't want no pig hanging around. So he go off he goes, and Pa salts down what's left. Casey said, while I was still preaching spirit, I made a lesson of that and spoke it to you, but I don't do that no more. What do you suppose he'd done a thing like that for? I don't know, said Joe. He just got hungry for pork. Makes me hungry just to think of it. I had just four slices of roasted pork in four years, one slice every Christmas. Casey suggested elaborately, maybe Tom will kill 
the fatted calf, like for the prodigal in scripture. Joe laughs scornfully. You don't know, Pa. If he kills a chicken, most of the squawking will come from Pa, not the chicken. He don't never learn. He's always saving a pig for Christmas, and then it dies in September, a bloat or something, so you can't eat it. When Uncle John wanted pork, he ate pork. He had her. They moved over the curving top of the hill and saw the Jode place below them. And Jode stopped. It ain't the same, he said. Look at that house. Something happened. They ain't nobody there. The two stood and stared at the little cluster of buildings.